So we're going to like it, take a look at Eastern Christianity, what was going on, and the co theological controversies that were going on over there. You should just see one screen that says Eastern Christianity, right? Yes. Okay, great. All right, so we have the, let's talk about the Eastern Orthodox Church a lot today, and again, those those controversies. Um, so we, we, we touched on a lot on the West last week, but today we're going to really focus on the East. Mm -hmm. Um, the um, East goes on for another thousand years after Constantine. Um, and, um, but, you know, there was a, a lot of foreign invasions, autocratic emperors. Uh, and so the, the, the empire and the church were kind of merged together. Whereas in the West, imperial and church were sort of separate entities. There's gonna be conflict, but what happens in the East is, is there's a merger in a sense of the emperor, of the Eastern emperor with the church, which meant that these Eastern emperors sometimes got involved in these theological uh, debates. And, um, and uh, that sometimes that involvement led to even greater uh, acrimony. Um, Theological controversy seemed to be uh, obsessive for the Eastern Church, whereas the Church in the West, they had other issues that they were dealing with. There was the Vikings, you know, uh, that that were a threat to the, the Europe, um, and it isn't until well after Charlemagne and Charles the Great, which we'll be looking at next week, that where we get some of the um, uh, the West thinking about theological issues, but the, the West is, is preoccupied with other things. The East, since they don't have a lot of invasions going on and they have relative peace, uh, they're able to focus a lot more on these, um, on, on these dec decisions about uh, Christ. And we've already had the Council of Nicaea and Constantinople that had decided that Jesus was divine, okay? Uh, that he was the second and 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 uh, person of the Trinity, and that he also said there is a Holy Spirit. But the question that still is, you know, needs to be debated is well, how are these natures of Jesus, his divine and his human nature, how are they joined in this person uh, of, of Jesus Christ? And so these are the, the controversies that are going to really obsess the church in the East. So there's like two sides of the argument. There is the Antiochian and the Alexandrian uh, coin. So we've got in the Antiochian, we've got an emphasis on the human nature of Jesus, whereas the Alexandrian school wants to focus on the divine nature of Jesus. And of course, whether you focus on the human or divine is going to make a decision about how you understand Jesus. And therefore it's going to have an impact in terms of, well, what did, how did Jesus save us? Um, but that's still not the major question. The, the East is trying to just figure out, well, how are they fused? Are they merged? Is, there, is Jesus really much more divine? And if he's much more divine, then he really is thinking like a, like a God. He knows he's God. He's dying on the cross as a God. What does that really mean? Can a God die? So there's all these kinds of debates that are going back and forth. The Antiochian side said, you know, um, focusing on that fully human psychology that that God dwelt in him but that the human was the main uh what was the main um uh, the willpower in a sense or Jesus's nature was mainly uh two natures but there was a human and there was a divine but the human was more operative um the Alexandrian side thought no nope, it's the, the divine that's really operating in him uh, Bishop Athanasius uh, said that the incarnation involved the union of the logos, the divine, with the human nature. So there was only one nature versus two natures. There was, in a sense, a fusion of these two natures. There was an additional character involved in the year 390, or died in 390, and he was a friend and supporter of Athanasius and uh, the Orthodox position taken at Nicaea. He was responsible for, for converting Basil of Caesarea 
uh, to the humusion position, which we talked about last week, which meant that there was a, uh, a, a union of the divine and the human, and that uh, Jesus's substance was, was uh, he, divine nature. And he wanted to affirm that Christ, the divine son, was immediately present to transform and divinize the sinful mortality of the human creature. So it was a dominant factor in that. He also taught that and Jesus was also, his ego or his life principle was the divine principle. He said that the divine son united with a complete normal human being for what would require the union of two competing wills, two minds, two selves, and hence two sons, human and divine. The unity of Christ would be destroyed and God would not be with us. So uh, Apollinaris represents a position that's going to be eventually looking like this, whereas the divine mind is overpowering the human soul, okay? Gregory of Nyssa opposed Apollinaris and uh, Gregory of Nazianzus as well. They said that it's not merely the flesh sin, but the soul and mind as well. And it was necessary for the divine logos to take a complete human nature intellect as well as an ensouled body. Today's reading that we had in the epistle of Paul to the Philippians uh, presents this position that the church eventually adopted, which is that the divine nature humbles himself entering the form of a human of humanity. And so there is a, a, a uh, divine self-emptying, but that self-emptying doesn't mean that the divinity is not present. It's just that one's aware, his awareness of his divinity is not there. So that position was very ancient because if you think about when Paul wrote those letters, they were written in the first century of Christianity. And so there was already a lot of, of uh, speculation about that humanity, humanity and divinity in, in Jesus. Gregory said that for that which he has not assumed, he has not healed. If he hasn't assumed humanity, then you can't heal humanity. But that which is united to his God head is also saved. Another position uh, was the Nestorian position. And um, he was concerned about defining the role of Mary. We'll get to that in a minute. But uh, he opposed the Antiochene position that the Christ is one composite nature, objecting that this negated what they wanted to affirm, namely that in Christ were two subjects of action and, and, and predication, two natures and two hypostases. Uh, the position was too much for those who embraced the Alexandrian position. And uh, the elevation of Nestorius to the Patriarchate of Constantinople in 428 brought the issue even further to a head. So um, he believed in the sense that you had two natures in one person. Uh, and many in the camp um, believed that Christ was two persons. It would look like this. Whereas you've got, you know, one face, but the unity of one nature, the divine overcoming the humanity. Okay. I know this gets a little technical, but this is what they were debating back then. And yeah. any questions? Yeah, um, hold on. Who's the uh, person uh, promoting the historian position? He is, he is. Uh, Theodore Musutia. Musutia, right. Musutia. And, yeah, he studied under that guy. Uh, but um, uh, it's, it, the man is called N Nestorius. Oh, that's his name. Yeah, Nestorius, and then Nestor oh, Nestorius to the Patriarch of Constantinople. Okay, gotcha. So the difference is that in the first case, Jesus is like is one the the God blended with the human. Right. In the second case, Jesus is like a schizophrenic. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Two minds, two wills, two natures. It's it's, it's kind of eventually that that position, of course, gets you know dealt with and we affirm a more 
because of the position that we that won, which was a, that uh, in Christ there is a humanity and, divi and divinity in one person. Um, so look, let's get to that here. And is this, um, I always struggled with philosophy. It seemed like the same, the same thing. It, it does for some people to, to say the same thing, but it's not. And, uh, and so the the, debate, what, what drives the difference theologically? What, what's really different about what you're assuming here? That, that what we're talking about is that there's a human nature and a divine nature in one person, one union. Yes. Uh, versus there are, uh, there's, a, there's a, a divinity absorbing the humanity. Um, and therefore, there is this one unique nature, this new creation, in the sense that it comes into the existence. That's the Eastern, is that the divinity absorbed the human? Yes. And that's a kind of a, what's called a monophysite position. But did, um, did Jesus just take on this human element when he was on earth? And then it was just so that we, he could come and teach and spread his. So, yeah, so the, the idea is the, the orthodox position that gets uh, promulgated is this one you see right in front of you right now, that there is this um, union in the, in the person of Jesus, but there are distinct natures. There is that the person is one face, but the, within that person is a human and a divine nature. Whereas Nestorius was saying that there are two persons, a divine person and a human person. Is that clear or is that still fuzzy? No, actually it looks like Nestorianism, I, I, I sort of took it all to be the opposite. That's why I'm confused because <laughs> if, you, if Nestorius said you have one face where the divine uh merges with the human that's emerging see that that's where whereas that the orthodox position or the the alexandrian is that the, these two natures do not fuse they're presented in one person but they're not fused they're still distinct so jesus is operating what he's saying is jesus is operating in his inhumanity he's not walking around thinking and knowing he's god okay so that's what we see in the gospels for example we see these examples of of Jesus having ignorance about what might happen. And then that, there's other places where he seems to be, you know, having a divine understanding of what happened. But those places where Jesus has that divine uh, foreknowledge are really retrospective reflections on the, by the gospel writers. Jesus is probably not expressing that real divine foreknowledge in his humanity. He can't, because if he does, He's going to go literally crazy. The schizophrenic, uh, you know, thing that you said, mm -hmm. yeah. the schizophrenia of of and the, the belief that he's you know, so when he's having that, that debate with the Pharisees, like what we had in our gospel today. Yeah, he's not speaking about it like he knows he's God. Okay, his he's a messenger of God, but not that he's God. He's not, you know, we knew he's God because we know now after the fact, but. When he's speaking, he's speaking as a human person, a messenger sent from God. John the Baptist was sent from God. The prophets were sent from God. You know, and many people believe that John the Baptist was a prophet. Many people but, believe that Jesus was a prophet, sent from God. But it's one thing to be sent, be a messenger, and the other thing is to be God. So Jesus, yeah. Jesus would not have held the position as a, as a live person a human person walking on earth in the first century, he would not have held the position that he was God. Yeah, but didn't he wonder when he was walking on water and raising people from the dead? That well, was it, exactly was being God's, just a messenger. This was God's power working through him. Just like Moses was able to do things through oh. God's power. So they don't say Moses was of two natures. No, that, that doesn't get, because the Jews maintain a... Um, a very strict monotheistic position. Right. Moses died. Moses had a funeral. Moses didn't resurrect from the dead. There weren't the kinds of same events in Moses' life that there were in his <clears throat> life. And could I just add that a lot of the um, 
terminology that this these debates were taking place in were Greek. And so like yeah. the tiniest difference in a, the Greek formation of a word, they're all Greek philosophy terms. And so there, there's this back and forth, you know, what exactly do we mean by this word? And you change one letter and all of a sudden it means this very different thing. Exactly. And it's hard to translate that back into English, much less 20, you know, 16 centuries later or whatever. Yeah, and, and the words have evolved as well in, in, in over, over, the, over this millennia. And so words like nature and substance and person have all uh, taken on different um, meanings for, uh, for the modern mind. But back then, um, the words that they actually use is prosopon, which we just saw that in, in, a, in a previous slide there. And the prosopon was the, the mask that actors would wear in a play. And so you never actually saw the real face of the person. It's the face that they put forth. And it could be a happy face. It could be a sad face, a face of tragedy. But the prosopon was, was the, 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 the mask. And so these theologians use uh, this word to indicate that behind the mask of Jesus is this nature of humanity and divinity, not a fusion of, 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 of natures, but distinct natures. Okay. At this time, did they address, and I've always wondered about this, I mean, this is the point to bring it up maybe later, but how does the idea of the Holy Spirit being on a separate person, did they address that at this time or does that no. come later? No, that, that's gonna come more a little bit later. Okay, then we can wait till we get there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's the only, um, like Holy Week that Jesus really warned the disciples, his disciples and followers, <clears throat> that he was the Son of God, and that he had was about to complete his mission on earth and go on to be with the Father. <clears throat> he he doesn't say to the disciples or the apostles that he is God. But he asked them, who, who do you think I am? Right. And that's that. But that's and the answers they give is, you know, it's you know, you are, you are the Christ. Christ, the Messiah. OK, so what does that mean for them? What did it mean for Jesus? You know, there is and there is a, a lot of different uh, understandings of what Messiah uh, could mean. But they were but, puzzled by what he was doing and saying, trying to tell them. Yes. Uh, yeah, that it's 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 a constant uh, they, they look like they're in constant ignorance yeah, of, of what Jesus is about in fact right after the resurrection what do they do they, they kind of like all go back to their they shrink back to their old jobs it's yeah. not like you've been with them for three years and you still haven't figured it out duh you know and and then these women come and say that they've seen him resurrected at the at you know at the at the tomb and they still they still seem to be uh, out, out of touch with with positions and it, it, so it, they begin to have a slow understanding. It's not really until Pentecost when the Holy Spirit, you know, descends on the apostles do they begin to have an understanding of who Jesus is, what his real mission was um, and what it means for them. And that's when they become, um, you know, missionaries and evangelists and go forth into the world to, to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. So. Uh, but all the things that he had done, I mean, walking on water and healing people and doing all those things, I mean, the disciples and all the followers were very much in awe of him. They were, they were in awe, but that was not, that did not prove divinity. It just simply proved that he was a miracle worker and that God was at work through him. But, but in the end, towards the, the Holy Week, he feels like he must let them know who he really is. And he's well, asking them, then, Jesus is Jesus is still declaring even on on Holy Thursday night, right? He's in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he is still in his humanity. He is having doubts. He's trying to struggle with his decisive yes to God. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I will do the will of the Father. That's very much in what he's talking about. It, it is your will, not mine. So he's still very much a human suffering messiah there 
he understands that this is the way that his mess messianic uh, mission must go. Yeah, Believing but he's left, he's left Peter and many of his disciples just wondering, well, kind of, should we stay with him or leave him? Or? Well, yeah, I mean, they're wondering, is this the Messiah? And, and uh -huh. we thought the Messiah was going to be this political uh, uh, king yeah. and that we would, when they ask him about being great, can we sit at your right and your left? Well, that's those, those are that they're thinking imperial political greatness and that we're going to be his right, we're going to be his lieutenants. Okay. Just like we as humans do. Yes. Yeah. Right. And, and, uh, and, uh, but Jesus knows already that his form of messiahship is, in, is going to involve suffering and death. Mm. And out of that, he believed, and they believed then at the end, that God would somehow make it right. And it would begin the inauguration of the kingdom of God. And the resurrection. And the, re yeah, the resurrection was the beginning of that. Okay, well, that must be proof that he's going to, that, that he's coming back. He's going to resurrect in his body and he's going to bring justice and wipe out the Romans and install this, you know, new kingdom. And then as, as the church begins to reflect on, on the nature of Jesus's mission and life and his death and resurrection, they begin to have different understandings. But do you what, think, do you think Jesus knew all along that he was the son of God or he was just, no, he, I think he was taught. I think his teacher was the Holy spirit teaching him slowly yeah. revealing to him as he could, what the mission was. He didn't start off, you know, yeah. in, in, in Nazareth and Galilee saying, okay, I know how this is all going to end. You know, I, I know the I know the ending before I've even begun. But he, he has not. All these things he's not gone to the final chapter in the book and said, "I know how this is going to end." He's not on the cross, thinking, "Oh, it three days I'll I'll be up again." You know, it's no big deal. I'm just yeah. pretend to suffer here. See, when you take on that kind of a an historian heretical position, it it really destroys Jesus' humanity. And what, what the church was trying to do was trying to preserve the humanity and the divinity of Jesus. And do you think that Mary taught him from a small child this? Because, you know, it says mm -hmm. in Luke that she kept all these things and treasured them in her heart. So I don't mm -hmm. know if she would share that with her growing child that she felt he was the son of God. I don't know that she would have said I think you're the son of God, but definitely God is, you're a special child. God has sent you here with a mission. Um, but she as a Jewish woman would have also, would not have embraced any kind of role of divinity. Um, you know, that right. he's going to be a Messiah, that he's going to be uh, having a special mission, perhaps, yes. Um, but, you know, when we're reading the story, keep in mind that that there is some embellishment here. There is some um, also that that these stories were written, you know, decades and decades after um, uh, Jesus began his his uh, had ended his mission, and that Mark, the earliest gospel, uh, did not have any kind of nativity story. It's only in Matthew and Luke. Uh, that, that we have these two stories. Um, and so what did Mary know and when, when did she know it? Uh, that's the question. Um, we don't know. Uh, well, what, like we can, what we can possibly assume is that she treasured these things in her heart, as you said, Georgia, and, and, and thought about it and said, well, how can God be in this person of Jesus? You know, she probably didn't say he's God, but that he's, he is uh, definitely sent from God as a messenger, okay. you know, with a special mission, but she doesn't know quite what that's all going to entail. Well, like all good mothers, she thought her son was just... He's the greatest. To be, yes, the greatest. <laughs> exactly. We but, all think... Uh, but our, she was told that he was going to be special, so she yeah, knew... Yeah, you know, and so, um, you know, I don't know that she was a helicopter mom, you know, sort of hovering around Jesus all the time. Uh, you know, but she definitely understood from the very first miracle at the wedding of Cana and Galilee 
that okay boy this this kid has got something he can yeah. turn water into wine you know um he, he really must be special but again keep in mind the jewish understanding is you know god is god and god operates through angels and through people and through prophets and through history you know god operated through moses god operated through david god operated through many prophets but that doesn't mean that the person that god is operating through or with uh, is God. I believe God is operating through me, as do many of you. That doesn't mean I say to myself, I'm God. If I did, I'd say, I, I'd, somebody would have to say, you're crazy also. <laughs> and that's what they would have done to Jesus. They would have locked him up in, in, the, in the insane asylum back then. And they would have said, you know, when you when you stop saying you're God, we'll talk. But until you take your medic medications, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, it, this ain't happening. You aren't, you aren't getting out of this jail. So Frank, there was, uh, I know from uh, what I know about Greek and, and uh, Roman mythology was that there was a, there were traditions and, and myths and views of demigods and Correct. virgin births and gods being born from gods and humans and stuff yes. like that. And uh, was there anything like that in the, in, in Jewish, uh, Jewish theology before Jesus? No. So by the time that the mess, uh, the when, when by the time that the apostles are preaching in the Mediterranean uh, and to Greeks and non-Jews, it's easy for Greeks and non-Jews to say, "Oh yeah, he's God. Yeah, that's that's you know we got gods. We got you know all these mythical Greek gods, and we've got you know gods." Uh, sleeping with and making, you know, demigods, you know, that this, we get that. That's part of our theology, our philosophy, our history. We don't have a problem with this. Uh, the whole idea uh, that um, uh, the Plato and, Neo, and, and the Neoplatonists um, uh, promoted was this idea that the divine is ensouled in the human and that at death, the, 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 uh, the person sheds the humanity and ascends back to the spiritual realm. No big deal for them. They they get this, but the but the, for the Jewish mind, uh, that is that is totally foreign. Um, and um, so we've got the reflect the, these gospels now are being written to audiences uh, that are non-Jewish, who are hearing this and going, yeah, I can deal with. Jesus being God, that's not a, doesn't present any issues for me. The question that the church is trying to struggle with in this fifth century is, well, how does that union happen? Okay. And, and that's where the Eastern church has the, has the time and the luxury, basically, to be able to debate these issues. There was even, there was more than one, um, um, Oh, and the emperor was God, you know, of course. And, and the emperor could be God, and, and and still and still be a person, and still be yeah, a human being. Exactly. And Athena, you know, the my personal favorite of the of, of the Greek gods was was the goddess the Greek god, goddess of war, and she so she wasn't born, she wasn't begotten, she sprang from Zeus's brain, Zeus's head, fully fully grown, fully clothed, you know, as an adult. She did not go through any birth or or you know developmental process at all so that th there was that there was that idea as well right and and there were all kinds of myths about gods coming into existence without going through the birth canal and being and having a childhood some of the gospels that get written later um after the gospel of john the gnostic gospels uh, present jesus as sort of a no childhood no birth no mixing the humanity. He's just walking around as God, you know, pretending to be human, uh, so that he, you know, so that people won't um, think of him strangely. So they, they, these, the, the further we get into history, and in the development of the church, the further there is this comfort level with Jesus's divinity. But initially, at the, you know, at the 
right after the the the, the the death and resurrection of Jesus, there is a lot of head scratching going, okay, we thought this guy was going to be the Messiah, the, the, the way we understood Messiah to be. Now he's resurrecting. What does this all mean? And so now the church is having to struggle with this. And for, for, for decades, there is this struggle of what does this all mean? What does then, what does it mean to be a follower of Christ? You know, is the is the end coming soon? Is it coming a week from next Thursday? Or are we waiting for something else? And so as the church begins to, to grow and develop and mix with the Greek uh, world, different um, understandings of Jesus's mission be, uh, become uh, more and more popular. And, um, uh, and so the, the, there's been an evolution of our understanding in a sense about what Jesus's role was, is what's going on. When I read in the creed, begotten, not made, right, right. I think of the difference between Athena and other demigods like Perseus and, and right. other, other, you know, but, but people, men, men, the man gods, you know, but born of a woman, but, but, but you know, uh, uh, conceived by a, by a god of some kind. Right. Am I right about that? Or is that just something that... That was the Aryan position that there was a time when Jesus was not okay. right when when there, there was a, a he he didn't exist and then he came into existence mm -hmm. and and he came into existence you know with uh with the advent of I mean he came into physical existence with the birth of Jesus and Mary okay the the human birth but that he existed at a certain point in in eternal time that was rejected and they said no jesus didn't come in he was not made out of god the father he always existed as a part of god the father the begotten the, the begotten was the the um the act of god separating and placing jesus in the in human history as a begotten thing is it something that's that's okay we've got an idea let's do this got an idea there we go gotten gotten an idea but this person was not in existence at, 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 didn't did not exist and then comes into existence which is a different thing mm -hmm. athena comes into existence she's made she is made yeah mm -hmm. made so that's why we get to the begotten not made you know he's okay. always of one being with the father you know uh so that that's yeah, they, they're like, let's be absolutely certain we get this clear in the creed. Yeah. All right, let's go on here. In 433, uh, John of Antioch sent Cyril his text called the Formula of Reunion, which admitted the use of Theotokos, which means that Mary was the mother of God. Uh, and also... And, and also that Christ was complete God and complete human being, and that a union of two natures had occurred as a consequence of which we confess one son. Cyril signed it with enthusiasm. Nestorius's cause was now lost and he was exiled. And the Cyrillian assembly at Ephesus was vindicated. So Cyril wins the day. Nestorius is declared a heretic. Uh, the document uh, ended up being the compromise, uh, which convinced all the Antiochenes had been duplicitous. And then he wrote against the teachings of Theodore of Tarsus and Theodore of Mosutia. Mos Mosutia. Uh, and the stage was set for uh, renewal of even more acrimony because not, not, when councils get called it seems like it always raises new new questions and so after this we get uh another council eventually the aftermath of the council of ephesus in this reunion document uh, in 433 john and, and cyril as I, I said agreed um victory for the alexandrian position um and the position of Nestorius is more like what is, what is called a monophysite position, which is, which is that there's one incarnate nature of the divine logos, 
and, and the Theotokos language was upheld as well as, as Orthodox. Uh, there was a truce with the Antiochenes, uh, and there was a, a understanding of complete God and complete human in the language. And both sides can, again, suspecting each other of, 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 um, of uh, recriminations and duplicity and that kind of thing. So um, finally, in, then there's in this other character, Eutychus. Uh, he's a leader of a monastery in Constantinople, and um, he supported uh, Dioscorus of Alexandria. And um, uh, he said basically that Christ had only one nature, one nature after the union. And that Christ's nature is a sort of a third thing, and a new thing that didn't exist before, but a, a new existence, a, a new kind of a thing altogether. Uh, that position also was eventually um, uh, condemned. And then Pope Leo uh, responds, and he argued in his, what's called Leo's tome, that Eutychus was foolish and ignorant. And he appealed to the baptismal creed of the Roman church, which we'll be using in our liturgies outside beginning next week, the apostles creed or the Roman creed, uh, that Christ has two substances or natures that remain intact and came together in one person. Uh, so this proves against, this uh, is set to be um, uh, the, the orthodox position. All right, and in 450, uh, let's see. Then just before the, the final council of Chalcedon in 451, uh, Theodosius calls for a council to meet in Ephesus in 449, but they actually meet in 451. And um, at that, just before, uh, they said, no, you know, Leo's position is wrong. So they denied the reading. They temporarily vindicated Eutychus. Um, Emperor Flavian died of the uh, suspicious circumstances on the way to his exile or to, the, excuse me, uh, uh, Bishop Flavian. Uh, and then there was this rupture between Rome and, and the East. And Leo calls the council that met that vindicated Eutychus a robber synod. And he called for a new council to be held in Italy. Theodosius, the emperor refuses. And then he accidentally dies in 450. And then uh, Pulchera and her husband who are Christian agree to this new council to be held in Chalcedon in 451. And that council uh, is called the Fourth Ecumenical Council. And they depose Dioscorus and Eutychus and uh, they rehabilitate this Antiochian position. Um, they read finally Leo's tome at that council and they craft a, a formula composed largely of phrases and ideas from Cyril's letters. It's, doesn't change the Nicene Creed. Uh, it just clarifies basically what those sentences mean for the church. But these uh, suspicious deaths of these people who were uh, leaders in the church, did they ever follow up and find out why? These well, I mean, uh, as, as we're going to see, uh, people were getting poisoned left and right. There were, there was a period of where of popes there were 17 popes in a row. They were stabbing each other, killing each other, burning each other, poisoning. Um, yeah, and we oh, even yeah, got crazy. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, this is just a, a, what you did back then. So the church isn't living a very Christian lifestyle. Is it? Um, that, what, which was the most recent pope that was there only very shortly? Was that Pope John? Pope John and, Paul and the First. John Paul the First, right. And he died. Right like within a few years of, of being within, uh, like uh, a, a month or two yeah yeah a few 23 days oh 23, oh, 23 days, days. Mm -hmm. yeah so that then, that wasn't that deemed suspicious also well it's been claimed that that it was suspicious that the mafia took him out or that the um italian um um mafia or or some of the 
that he was going to begin investigations of the Vatican Bank and corruption and all that kind of stuff. And uh -huh. so they needed to, to kill him. Uh, I think was in, speculated in the Dan Brown novel. It was in, oh, the, yeah. <laughs> in, the, it was in the Godfather three kind of thing. And, um, you know, you get these honest popes who try to reform and, and, um, and then they prove to be too much for the Italians. And we're going to get that a little bit in the intrigue that we're going to talk about with Pope Urban the sixth. Okay. Um, where he, um, he's a reforming Pope and he wants to tell all the Cardinals, the Italian Cardinals that, you know, that, um, uh, that they've got to, um, um, you know, reform, stop wearing, you know, uh, beautiful jewelry and, and, uh, he's gonna, you know, he's gonna, um, pack the College of Cardinals with French, with, you know, and, and that he's, he's, he's just, and it says that they, that it, it, history's books will tell you that he offended them, uh, but it's not that, it's, I will, I, I will tell you the real secret of, of uh, Pope Urban the Sixth. <laughs> but the, the, the Pope prior to this current one, he retired, which is really very uh, not normal. For yeah, not usual. It's, it's the only, he's the only the second Pope ever that's, I think, retired. Yeah. Um, but most Popes uh, died of natural causes, but there were many that were killed, murdered, you know. Um, well, maybe he had Alzheimer's or something like that, so he find that it was... Benedict? I, I, you know, he just, he, he, I think he saw what was going on with John Paul II, who hung on far too long. And you know, ended up dying in office as most popes uh, have done. And he didn't want to go that way. He could see, you know, I don't want to be in a wheelchair, frail, can't even speak. I'm just, you know, I'm, 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 you know, uh, salivating and and it's all, all, you know, I'm spitting. You know, I he I I think he saw that. We all saw that, and it was really sad. But at the same time, it honored, you know. Uh, people's old age and, and sickness. And I think that was what the Pope was, I think what um, what Wojtyla, Carol Wojtyla was trying to do is to sort of say, hey, nothing wrong about being old, you know? Um, and um, uh, so he um, he stayed on too long and, and Benedict, I think, read the writing on the wall and said, you know, it's time to- He also it. bailed, he also bailed, um, um, all, right, right ahead of the big scandal with the Vatican Bank, yeah, and the and the and the the, the peak of the scandal over uh, sexual abuse by priests. Yes, yes, he, he bailed right ahead of those. I have no special knowledge about any of that, but that's right. what colors his retirement for me. Yeah, yes, of course, yes. So, um, yeah, so I mean, there's a lot of bad popes in history, a lot, and. Um, as we're, we're going to get to them soon here. We're, in a week or two, we're going to be talking, looking at all these popes. And in fact, my students are writing the, in the School for Ministry, their homework for the week is they have to write about how do you get rid of a bad pope. And they have to draft <laughs> legislation. And uh, it's a, you know, so it, it, from a legal standpoint, uh, Janice, you'd appreciate that one. Uh, so if the pope is senile or insane or, is there a twenty fifth uh, amendment somewhere? The world? Yeah. <laughs> right. Corruption. And and um, the way that actually got resolved, uh, which you know, when we have that one point three, three to four popes, is a council comes together, and that's what they're going to be researching this week, is uh, on the concept of conciliarism, which is the idea that a church council comes together and makes those final decisions. And, uh, and and can be the authority. Of course, that you do you do that, and that challenges the authority of the pope. Um, you know, so is it the council that runs the church, or is it the the pope that runs the church? And so, the Episcopal Church has come clearly on the side of of convention or council. It is when we the church meets in council that that we make decisions, and we have vestries, we have you mm -hmm. know conventions, and we don't make decisions with. You know, the presiding bishop doesn't come around and say, okay, this is what the, the new rules are and we're gonna live by them all. No, it's something that we all have to talk about and vote about. So it's it's um, it's a, a opposite of what the, you know, the traditional papacy has been is a more democratic kind of 
of uh, functioning. Uh, where, where is this place where they had the council in 451? Cal Calcedon. Calcedon is in Asia Minor. <clears throat> uh, like it's um, Eastern Church. E Eastern, let me, I'd like to look at look for it exactly, but um, maybe one Turkey of you or... take a look at it and see where exactly yeah. where it is. Father Munoz, what the, the question a lot of this presents for me is I don't see inspiration in this. I see, uh, you know, uh, power, power plays. I don't see I don't see the spirit moving in this. I have a hard time taking any of these seriously, any of them with any theological impact, with any feel, with any Christian significance at all. And, uh, you know, it's uh that some of these they weren't just you know imperfect ministers some of these people were evil mm -hmm. they were they were murderers they were you know they, well, it's they, what they, they were cruel they uh, you know it, it, they were it, very it, roman emperor kind of stuff yeah, and, yeah exactly so what's happened is the church has evolved into using the instruments of political power to win arguments and so it the, that that spirit of early Christianity seems to be um, not present, and it, it it's the um, it's this the church um, becoming uh, powerful like the state and using that power. Um, now keep in mind, as early as Paul's letters, we have Paul um, trying to settle disputes. That are going on in the church. Um, so conflict has always been a part of the church. Um, and, um, um, you know, whenever we've used power wrongly, it corrupts people. And uh, the East is an example of the use of corrupt power and using that imperial power to enforce uh, a win, an orthodox position. Remember, History gets written by the winners. And mm -hmm. what we know about these heretics is known largely through what the <coughs> winners of history, the Orthodox said, because the, these uh, texts and speeches and you know things that were written by these uh, heretics were destroyed by the Orthodox. And so what we know about Nestorius or Eutychus is gonna be colored by how the Orthodox present this. I don't uh, disagree with you at all, Janice. I, you know. Martha, what were you saying, about to say? Oh, so I was just raising my hand to say that I looked up where Chalcedon is located and it's, if you look at a map of Turkey is modern day yeah. um, where it is. So modern day Istanbul, if you just kept going a little bit east um, is where right. yeah. Chalcedon was. It was called Asia Minor back then. Sure. <clears throat> and I was curious about Ephesus because having been there and, and done a really interesting tour, but it um, what I'm seeing is that Ephesus as a city was destroyed in 262 by an invasion of the Goths, and that this council was at the Church of St. Mary, which was the um, purported, uh, well, it was purported that, that one of the Johns, I'm not sure which one, uh, brought her to, um, to that area to live after Christ died, after Jesus died. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah. she was held there under his protection. Or not held, but she stayed Wasn't there. Under his John, protection. the disciple whom Jesus loved, that had the, yeah. yes, in that Yeah. But Ephesus was destroyed by an earthquake too, wasn't it? Yeah, there was an earthquake in the Goths. And, and I mean, it was, I, I, that's what I was thinking, the capital of Ephesus. In the fifth century, and I thought I thought emphasis was really a defunct by then, and, and indeed it probably was, except for this one church. Let me summarize essentially what's going on in these early theological controversies. Is, is, yeah, there's several please. Of them. Yeah, and so there's there is the Gnostics, right? So these were the ones that claimed to have secret knowledge that only Jesus had given to some people, and it had gotten passed on down through. The decades and now these gospels are being written that proclaim a a, a jesus who's divine uh 
has this divine knowledge and that the knowledge is what saves you. It's not uh, anything else that saves you, but it's a special secret knowledge that Jesus imparted. And, uh, and so we get gospels that are written along those lines. We talked about a couple of weeks ago, we talked about Marcion who wanted to, you know, reject anything that looked like the God of the Old Testament was involved in, <clears throat> in Christianity. So he wanted to sanitize Christianity of anything Old Testament or anything Jewish or Hebrew. So he only takes portions of Luke, some of Paul's letters, uh, but rejects anything that smacks of a, of a continuing God in the Christian world, that there are essentially two gods, one Old Testament God and a New Testament God. Hmm. And <clears throat> another group that was more of an ecclesiastical kind of a heresy were the Montanists. And they um, said... Uh, that the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, is moving uh, freely amongst us, <coughs> causing people to speak in tongues and prophesy, and the church shouldn't stifle the Spirit with dogmas, rules, and, and leaders, and bishops, and all that kind of stuff, and the end of the world is, is coming soon. They're still around. <laughs> uh, they're called uh, um, Assemblies of God, <laughs> or Pentecostals. Um, other ones we, we talked about briefly is that the Apollinarian position that said that Jesus is fully God, he's only incompletely human, and that was dealt at the Council of Constantinople. We got the Arians, which we talked about last week, that says that Jesus came into existence at a certain point in history. The Nicene Creed dealt with that. We've got the, the, the Docetists who said that Jesus was completely divine. He only seemed real, kind of like a ghostly Jesus, kind of like Casper the Friendly Ghost kind of Jesus. <laughs> and then you get the Ebionite position that said, no, Jesus was a prophet uh, and he was not God. And uh, he emphasized, they emphasized the Jewish law and they rejected Paul's teachings because Paul began to elevate uh, Jesus' divinity uh, and um, make him into God. Well, wouldn't that be the Jewish position? That would be that would be closest to the Jewish position, yes. And the Ebionites are still around. Uh, they're in North Africa, uh, and they've really um, uh, were they were outlawed for a while. They were heretics, but they they seem to have cropped up again in in parts of North Africa that was uh, away from all of the um, controversies and all of the uh, tribal and imperial. Uh, power plays that were going on in the East, in the Eastern Church. Um, but these are just some of the positions that the church has condemned. Then the, the Manichaean position uh, preached a, a sort of idea of a, there's good versus evil in the world, flesh is bad, uh, the spirit is good. Uh, it, it, it had its roots in uh, the Zoroastrian and Persian religions of Iran. And um, they uh, had a, a brief uh, uh, early, middle, early uh, medieval uh, stint, and I'll talk about that uh, in subsequent weeks. Um, then there was the uh, monar uh, monarchianism position, which divided the unity and the sovereignty of God, and that, uh, you know, that, that God's sovereignty is, 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 uh, is different than the sovereignty of Jesus. And so Jesus was a human who became God, like an adoptionist position, you know, he was adopted into the Godhead. And then there's this modalistic form of it, which is the Trinity as one God with different modes of divine action rather than distinct persons. Uh, so, you know, one God, but operating in different ways or different operations. What's wrong with that? Well, the, the orthodox position is that, that God is, is, is one, but that God has three persons. That's the word that, that, that the church uses. It's not that there is um, uh, the, there is, it's not that there is the, um, it's not just that the, op that God operates differently, but that God is uh, operating with, in a sense, three faces, three persons. So it's not that different from the traditional Trinitarian position but it's that difference between the action and the personhood. Uh, so there are the, the, and we speak about that often, you know, we speak about the, the Holy Spirit as a, uh, an actor 
that is acting in the world and through people. Uh, but the reality is that in tr the Trinitarian Orthodox position, God can, uh, God can act as Father, as Son, or as Holy Spirit. There's no separation in their actions. Uh, so I think that's kind of like, again, there's a fine line here, but that, that is the line that, that the church drew. I'm not Here's seeing it. the line. And I, I don't see why they felt necessary to call them separate people. I just, I'm not understanding oh, again, what you're not saying. Separate, they're not separate people. It's not tr three gods. It's God presenting the person of God in three, three modes. Well, that mm -hmm. sounds like modalistic then. Yeah. Three, mo three, well, again, it's tr I'm trying to use the word mode here and trying to use the word person. A mode is a, a means of behavior, whereas person is the face or the presence that, that, is, that, that, that puts forth. Like, for example, you see my face, but you don't see me acting different than my face. It's, 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 a, it's um, a distinction. It's, it's like a permanent position. Is that it? Rather yeah. than three yeah, actions I, that may come and go, it's like yeah. I'm permanently acting in this way, and I'm permanently acting in this way, and I'm permanently acting in this way. Yeah, I think that'll that'll work. That makes I, it seem more like a person's face. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Again, I say it's, it's the ancient Greek to modern English translation that becomes really sticky whenever we look at these councils and their agreements. Yeah. It almost seems like the difference between those two things is, is, is sort of like how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. And how can we even know? I mean, we're all just people. So I don't know why she really even matter that well, much. We're all trying. This is, the thing is, we're trying to understand um, stuff that, that um, uh, for the Greek mind, it seemed like we got to really parse this. And the West was just not concerned about these things. Uh, the West had other fish to fry, and uh, uh, and they were busy. And uh, this was not the this was more of an Eastern preoccupation. And as we'll see in the next slide here, that that preoccupation causes a division in the church, which happens in 1054. Now there were a lot of reasons for it, um, and I'll let you look at those slides that I sent out to you to get into the detail of the, of it. But essentially, the reason all this happens and is that there's jealousies between the, the two patriarchs of Rome and Constantinople. There's differences in language, customs, culture. Um, and then there's two individuals involved here that are really um, difficult people. Um, Michael Cyrillius, the patriarch of Rome, because um, he's asserting authority of, of his see of Constantinople. And, and, and he's, he's, he's opposing this equality of uh, uh, to Rome, Rome wants to affirm its superiority, and they the East wants to reject that. Is Leo the Ninth a uh, an emperor or a pope? He pope. Okay. Yeah, and he's he's a reforming type of pope, but he wants to, you know, he makes the fatal mistake of of sending the wrong cardinal to to bring the message, and he sends um, Cardinal uh, Humbert, and um, as, as the legate. And so when he gets there, uh, there's mutual in, insulting of each other between these two churchmen. And um, uh, at one point, uh, uh, yeah, Cyrilius calls him, uh, uh, on, he lays a, an altar on the altar, a sentence of excommunication. And he calls him, uh, uh, you know, he's, he's with the devil and his angels and, and ends it with a triple amen and excommunicates the Western legate and the West and, and, and Cardinal Humbert uh, is not interested in having a conversation, um, didn't want to learn Greek, uh, didn't bother with it. And, you know, they all just mutually excommunicate each other. And the schism has been in existence since today to this day. So again, reasons, Rome wants to be supreme. Uh, they are suppressing the Greek language. It's now Latin in the West. And here's the real uh, big kicker, was that the church started using the word added to the Nicene Creed, what's called the filioque or the, uh, the, the filio and the son. L literally filioque means and the son. 
we added it to the Nicene Creed. We pray it that way, by the way. And the East doesn't have that addition. The Holy Spirit, for the, in the in Eastern understanding, the Eastern understanding is that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father, not and the Son, the way it is in our Nicene Creed. So um, the, the Eastern Church said you have no right to change something like that uh, and, and change the usage. And so it, 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 up to this day, that is still uh, a major bone of contention. And there are many Western churchmen who are beginning to say, and the Episcopal Church is beginning to say, just need to drop the yoke way. Uh, but until there's actual, the, the rift is actually healed, uh, the church is not in any kind of hurry to make that, uh, make that change. Again, a very subtle little change that the West makes uh, and uh, you know, the East can't, can't take it. And then in the, in, you know, the, add injury to insult, <clears throat> what's kept the East and the West from even unifying even further is when crusaders went on, on in, in the fourth crusade, they brought such, um, oh, they made such a mess of things in the East that the Eastern church said, you know, we don't even want these people anymore. Uh, we, we don't want them coming to our aid because they were in, involved in so much destruction in, in the East. So, um, so the, the, the church finally united for, for so many years, for 1,054 years, now splits. We've got the Western church and the Eastern church. And in the West, we've continued to divide uh, in, with the Protestant Reformation over here. And some of the Eastern churches did unite with the Western church uh, and they are, they, uh, they're united with, uh, under the papacy, but they are, they've maintained their Eastern um, uh, culture, language, um, <clears throat> clerical marriage uh, has been maintained by those Eastern Rite uh, Catholics, I'm sometimes called Uniate Catholics because they united with, uh, with Rome. So I'll take whatever questions, you, continued questions you have. I, I skipped some of the material uh, that, um, that we, before the, the schism and after Chalcedon, you feel free to take a look at that. This was the iconoclastic uh, controversy, the use of images. Um, essentially, uh, there were those who, who thought that um, uh, the church shouldn't be using images because they could, you know, uh, present idolatry. Uh, they, it could be looked at idolatry. <clears throat> the East was also uh, having pressure from the, the Muslims who didn't want there to be uh, symbols of, of, uh, of, um, of objects of worship, of divine worship. Um, and um, uh, well, the, the commandments, the Ten Commandments. Right. And so there, were, there was that whole, you know, uh, the, the ones who liked the images and those who wanted to destroy the images, the, the iconoclasts were the ones who wanted to destroy those images. Um, the, you know, a lot of these I, um, icons were being produced by these monks, and they were becoming fairly wealthy from the production of these uh, of this. So finally, that was this controversy uh, was settled at the Second Council of Nicaea, and um, uh, uh, and uh, the last one to be called ecumenical, by the way. Um, and so there was a distinction made again. Here's this distinction: words, latria versus dulia which is latria is is um is worship of god whereas these icons are venerated again the distinction between worship and veneration they're special we we call icons windows to god uh but they're not um something we worship so i have icons in my home um and um uh they are not worse things i worship they are things that that point me in the direction of God. They're an, uh, a window to God, like the a, 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 same way that an icon on your computer opens you to the program, the application. Uh, icons open us to a greater and deeper understanding of God. So I'll end there and take whatever additional questions you may have or talk about yeah, anything. I, I, want I to. had a question. Um, one of the slides you had up there where you said something about mother, and you summarized uh, Mary as mother of God. Oh, yeah. And having been raised Catholic, um, Holy Mary, mother of God, who would say that, uh, yeah. that prayer all the time. And um, there was much more um, 
veneration, I guess, of Mary, and, mm -hmm. and I think still is, I'm not sure, in the Roman church as compared to the Protestant church. And I was, at, but I'm wondering if that's something that, um, you know, like in the Episcopal church, I hardly ever see or hear a mention of Mary or her role or any prayers to Mary or anything like that. And uh, so I was wondering, was that part of the Reformation? Is it something we as Episcopalians just evolved into? Um, is it something that the Catholic church is also evolving away from? I'm not sure what's happening. Sure. That. Yeah, let me, let me deal with that great question. Um, the church has not officially uh, the Catholic Church has not officially uh, proclaimed Mary as Theotokos. That is something the Orthodox Church has done. They have allowed the Theotokos um, theology to exist, but they've not declared it as a dogma uh, and, and it's something that you must hold. Uh, so the church since Vatican II has, has the Catholic Church has tried to um, uh, play down and lessen the role of Mary so that it doesn't become cultish or where Mary doesn't get worshiped. The Protestant reformers were very concerned about the superstitious nature of, of Marian cults and that kind of thing. And um, so they played down the role of Mary uh, dramatically. In the- but Father, uh, there, was, there was something in your notes earlier that I noticed that uh, Mary was recognized as the mother of the earthly Jesus? Christ, Christokos. Yes. Christ, Christ no. mother of the Christ. See, the, the word God-bearer, Theotokos, comes too close to what the church would say is that, that she's in a higher position than Jesus, or that she's in an equal position to the Father, and that there's sort of this um, divinity to her. Uh, how can a human woman be the mother of a divine Thing. Now, the, the Theophilus isn't saying that she's uh, that she's um, uh, that she gave birth to a god. She, she did, but that she bore the humanity and the divinity within her womb, um, and, and that's about as much as you can say that uh, that what they condemned or the Nestorian what Nestorius wanted to condemn, which is that the womb is not that which was formed in the womb is not God. God was within the one who was assumed, is what Nestorius said. So the, the, he was saying it was more appropriate to call her the, the Christ bearer. But again, the, um, the Orthodox position in the East one and was proclaimed Theotokos. But again, the Western church didn't move in that direction. Uh, and they maintained a much more... Um, focus on Mary as it's to be venerated uh, and to be um, uh, venerated because of her role in Jesus. So whenever we're talking about Mary, we're really talking about, well, what is Mary's relationship to Jesus? And he, but but he, don't some Catholics believe in praying to Mary that she right. would intercede for them? Well, right. but, but, but we ask people to intercede and pray for us all the time. So that's not, in other <laughs> words, they, what they, what these, Catholics believe is that Mary has a more privileged role, closer role to Jesus because she's the mother. And therefore, if I ask for my son to do something for you, on, uh, for you, he's going to do it more because I'm asking, you know, rather than simply an apostle. So she's ranked above the apostles. And, um, and that's what that position would hold is that Mary has this Kind of outranks more veneration yeah it, and it's not not worship but veneration in other words we ask people to intercede that's why we have prayers of the people mm -hmm. please pray for me well i'm asking for for you to pray for me edna um and i'm asking other people to, i'm asking the church to pray for us for, for pray for me we ask a saint to pray for us mm -hmm. so it's really no difference uh, in asking people to pray, uh, it doesn't mean that you worship this person. So if I stand at the at the at the foot of the saint and I'm worshiping that saint, that's that's wrong, and that's what the reformers tried to do was make that distinction. So, but what they ended up doing was they threw out the baby with the bathwater and really said, let's get rid of all this whole saint veneration stuff and let's get rid of it. The Anglican Church 
um, especially um, the what is called the um, Oxford movement, uh, which gave birth to the whole Anglo-Catholic uh, movement. As, as you know, in other words, not, not gave birth to it, but but elevated the Anglo-Catholics or the Catholics within Anglicanism to a higher position. And so you have churches like um, St. Michael's and Carlsbad here in San Diego, and I don't know what's going on at All Saints Hillcrest, but churches like these Anglo-Catholic parishes have uh, sometimes a little Marian altar, a statue of Mary with some flowers off to the side, okay? And that's a place, uh, and there are candles there, and you can go and light candles. And some of these churches actually have um, services uh, and, and prayers that are offered um, either at the beginning or at the end of the liturgy uh, to Mary. Uh, and, um, and, and these are churches where Mary has, has a higher level of veneration. A lot of other churches in the Anglican, Anglican Communion and the Episcopal Church have absolutely no um, mention of Mary, no prayers to Mary, no statues of Mary, um, but um, uh, it, it just varies within the Anglican Communion because we are a high church and low church uh, and middle church, kind of we have broad in, in the middle, high and low, and uh, the low in the middle tends to ignore Mary a bit, and the high church, of course, venerates uh, Mary a lot. I so, wonder, uh, Canterbury or York, would they, would, would they venerate Mary like they do? In the yeah, the, um, yeah, there was, a, there was the, uh, the whole Walsingham uh, um, movement, or is, is it because um, Mary was reported to have been uh, seen, there was a vision of Mary there at, at that oh, yeah. um, and uh, which church uh, is that? What, where? Walsingham. In Walsingham. In England. Walsingham. Walsingham. Yeah. Where's that? That's in England, right? In, oh. in England, um, it's on the. Um, it's on the, on, east um, on the east coast. East coast, I think. Yeah. 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 So, um, but in fact, right here behind me is is um. Uh, is the our is the Our Lady of Walsingham, and here's my little Marian. Oh shrine right there i've got and uh, these are all uh, an icon of mary uh, another picture here and i have another little so in, in walsingham the virgin actually appeared um, well there was a vision a, a, vision? a woman had a vision somebody had a vision there uh forget the story um but yeah. there was a vision of mary and so the, the whole sort of a um a cult around walsingham came into existence and they have pilgrimages there, don't they? Pilgrimages there, yes. It's uh, yeah, considered a, my, my friend. A, one of the holiest places in England. Hmm. Yes, yes. But it's it's known by the and promoted by the Episcopal Church, not by the Anglican the, Communion. Yeah, it's the Anglican. Yeah. yeah. Okay. When when I was a kid, um, I had an strange experience with statues that I can't quite sort out because it happened when I was too young. But my father was Episcopalian and converted to Catholicism when he married my mother. Uh, but his mother remained Episcopal. Um, she was an artist and she had acquired these plaster Paris statues of Jesus and Mary. They were about a foot tall. They were big. Mm -hmm. And um, she, she painted them and gave them to me as a present. And I had them through my teen years. They somehow disappeared and I did not disappear them. But a lot of my things disappeared when I left for college. But um, it, I can remember when she gave it to me that my father had a horrible fit about those statues and that I shouldn't keep them. And, and, I, and I don't, he wasn't real religious. So I don't know why he would have had a strong point of view, but he that was his them and- that was his Episcopalianism coming yeah, out. Yeah, there was something about that coming through, but she was Episcopalian and she made him for me. So um, I don't understand what it was all about. Maybe he was in the midst of having well, big fights with I, his I, mother. I, I don't just, know. Here's, I'm, guessing, I'm guessing that he kind of converted for her sake. For my mother's was, sake. For your mother's sake. And yeah. she converted because she was just zealous. No, no, no. Believed. My mother was born and baptized Catholic. Okay. My, oh. my father converted, and his mother is the one that made the statues. We okay. made Episcopalian. But your mother was was born and baptized a Catholic. Yes. Okay. So she did not convert, and my no, my okay. father converted because the local priest wouldn't marry them until right. he did. Right. And she was the more, and she was the the, the the real Catholic, the true Catholic. 
Uh, yeah, I guess so. She was the one yeah. that had a real fear of the priest. Let's put it that way. <laughs> she, was, she was the real deal then. Yeah. So, yeah, like I was forbidden to go to kindergarten because there was no Catholic school kindergarten and the priest told her it would be a mortal sin if I were to go to the public school kindergarten. Oh, my gosh. I know there were a lot of weird, these little sporadic things I remember about. He must have been my, Irish, that priest. It must have been Irish. It must yeah, have been he probably Irish. was. All and, my and conflicts in the church are with Irish be, priests. I was supposed to be baptized. <laughs> he would not baptize me with my birth certificate name either because my middle, Susan, was not considered a saint's name. No. And my middle name, it, it's a Santa Zana. It is a saint. He didn't know that. And um, and Lee is was my my birth certificate's middle name, and that was not considered a Christian name, short for Elizabeth or nickname for Elizabeth, which definitely is a, a saint. So yeah. he was not well educated. Let's put it that way. So I wound up with Susan Ann. So Ann was good because that was the mother of Mary. <laughs> I had when I when I announced to the Catholic high school that I was campus minister of that I was. Uh, converting to the Catholic, to the Episcopal Church. Wow. And I said I'd, I'd gotten a job at St. Margaret's in San Juan Capistrano as the, as the youth oh, minister okay. and yeah. um, teacher. She said, who? <laughs> <Saint Margaret. laughs> who? She's a saint. You know, she, she gave wow. me that sort of yeah. uppity nun yeah. kind of attitude. Oh, yeah. yeah. So. Well, I have to say the nuns are, are I'm, I'm pretty sure that's where I learned about Jesus and, and a respect for Jesus and a respect for um, somewhere in there, I was taught to respect all races and sick people and, and uh, you know, people that, that weren't getting uh, full societal attention. I, but because they certainly did not get that from my parents at all. And, and so something happened that was good about the Catholic schools, I guess. Amazing what heretics can teach you, huh? Ah. <laughs> ah. <laughs> I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't, some of my nuns were heretics, I'm sure, the, especially the one that used to hit me on the hand with a ruler when I misbehaved, but there were others that were very loving, so that, that was very good. I had a Capuchin uh, Franciscan priest who used to wrap my hands at CCD with a ruler. Uh, um, yeah, that's what, yeah. I still have a scar right there, you can see it. Yeah. That was the norm in those days, uh, yeah, I remember at the elementary school. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the king. Bear the rod and spoil the child. That's right. <laughs> yep. That was uh, it wasn't only just Catholic schools. I was, yeah. I got nailed on the knuckles for not knowing my times tables. Yeah. yeah. Well, mine was okay. over failing to do long division. I would oh, daydream. Yeah. It. <laughs> but, that, and that was, you know, just a regular old school. We're missing. Who can't do my times tables? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, thank God those days well, are Well, the, the, uh, the, 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 so what we're seeing here, essentially, uh, that's, uh, we're, in terms of even our stories, that, uh, that, that, that the, the church, depending on its uh, location, geography, its culture, yeah. takes on different um, modes of, of being church. Yeah. Yeah. So the Irish church, for example, the Irish Catholic church, you know, are the ones that, that brought the whole idea of private confessions, with rule books and manuals for the for the monks and the priests for their penance. to get <laughs> dole out the penance appropriately, and the Western Church would adopt the Irish approach. Uh, so okay. the Irish were very very strict legalists, yeah. hmm. and and the Eastern Church is all so wound up, as we saw today, they're all wound up about these you know theological distinctions you know in in Jesus' person, hmm. and and you know we we really don't know. We can we hmm. just philosophically conjecture and, and and we think about things uh, in, in different ways and the west was just all concerned about you know you know saving saving their 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 empire their their uh, papacy and the western imperial powers and the kings and the dukes and the the vikings in, in invading the visigoths and the ostrogoths all these different groups invading it and so they're they're trying to sort out practical issues whereas the east is trying to sort out speculative theological philosophical issues that's the main key difference between the east and the west and why eventually in 1054 they they split yeah so so the 
the Eastern has mean, the Eastern Church has maintained a much more elevated understanding of Jesus' divinity. That even though they we settled with this idea of the human and the divine, the East tends to be a bit more monophysite. That is, that you know, it tends to, well, Jesus is you know God. Oh yeah, yeah, he's human, but you know, he's really, really God. And so that means he's walking around knowing stuff that only a God would know. Whereas the West has maintained a much more balanced, I. Uh, you know, humanity and divinity. Um, although the divinity has sometimes, you know, surfaced a bit strong within the West, it has been, been you know, more balanced approach in the West, so. Well, and more emphasis, I think, in the Protestant religions too. Um, well, no, the passion of Jesus was heavy in, in the Catholic Church, but more emphasis on the passion, which could only be experienced by a man. If you, if, if you were God, you kind of float through the top of it and not be affected by it. It would be a real passion. Right. So that that's that's something that I always heard. The, in, the, in the East, there's been a greater focus on the resurrection. Um, right. That's a bigger deal. Um, and for the West, it's Jesus' uh, crucifixion. That's been a, a greater focus. Um, for Anglicans, it's Christmas. <laughs> we remember Christmas really well, you know. Um, you know, there's nothing like going to an Orthodox church on on Easter Sunday, because every every Sunday is Resurrection Sunday for them. But boy, gotta go to a midnight mass for an of an Anglican church, uh, you know, an yeah, Episcopal I church. Love, we I really love, do. Love those. We With do the Catholic. incarnation really well. We do the Christmas really well, and go to a Catholic church on Good Friday because they, they know how to do that really yeah. well. Yeah. So. Have, um, th speaking of the Trinity, Father, have you, um, are you familiar with a book called The Shack that was written? I, I am familiar with it. I, I attempted to read it once and I got bored oh, and uh, oh, didn't finish it. Oh. I, yeah, I, I, uh, I, I got a little, I don't know, just, just bored. Uh, bored and distracted, you know, by something else probably. I read it, but I didn't know what to make of it in the end. So. Yeah, isn't there a movie? Then there a movie coming? Yeah, out? they say the movie doesn't really cover it very well, though. Yeah, it's yeah. it's too much. There's there's too much sort of thinking through the whole thing. Yeah, and, and it can allow for a little heresies to creep in here and there. So yeah, but is there a is there a book at all that fills in all the the missing parts in the Bible from the time Jesus was born until you know the end of his life. There's so many missing parts there. Right. Uh, the early church apostles and the writers of the gospels just didn't think that stuff was important enough to write about. Yeah. Um, so what do, what can we say what can we say about Jesus' childhood? Yeah, it's probably like every other Jewish child in in the village. Hmm. Uh, what could what can we say about his uh, his teenage years? Yeah. Pretty, he argued. Pretty, but pretty he argued to, in the temple. <laughs> other but kids, even you know. The disciples, even the disciples, there's a whole lot left out. Just make right. Yeah. So uh, that's why our faith is an apostolic faith. It is not a faith in the historical Jesus. It is a faith in what is it the apostles mm -hmm. believed about Jesus, shared about Jesus, and it's their faith that we're adopting. Not, you know, we can't get to the real historical Jesus. It's just too hard to get there. Too many years, too many veils to penetrate, and too much of our own interpretations, our own uh, veils that we're wearing that color the way we're going to even apprehend uh, the Gospels. It's like looking at a piece of art, you know. Sure One person looks at a piece of art and says, oh, I see this. And I go, I don't see a thing. It's just a bunch of colors, you know. And so, <laughs> I'm sure, it, it, I'm sure the Essenes and some of the other followers uh, in the Christian faith had books and uh, writings about those intervening years that we don't know about. Right. Are uh, there are there other writings? Oh yeah, there's Gnostic Gospels. Like uh, yeah, that were not. Yeah, it is. It is. I did. I spent a couple years once just reading all of the um, the un. Uh, uh, um, and what what, what do they know? And what have they said that that we don't know? They well, don't <laughs> what it, what it reveals to us is that that um, that in these in the, in the second and third century there was a lot of uh, focus on the divinity side of Jesus, 
and um, in, in a, in a, a, and those gospels reflected that divine, you know, agent that comes, that, that God comes into the world and then shares this special knowledge. That's why they're called knowledge is gnosis. And so they're, they're sharing the special knowledge and um, they write gospels that reflect uh, that kind of, um, of, uh, of, of secret knowledge in the like gospel of Mary, the gospel of Thomas, of James. Um, but they, all, what they reveal is there was great diversity in the early church is mm -hmm. what it reveals. It doesn't give us any new information about Jesus that is credible or that is historical. It just says lots of people had lots of different ideas about what it means to be um, a, 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 um, a divinity. And so, so they're not including those books because it might be misleading. Is that right? Did the, the they, early when church... They, when they put the Bible together. Yeah, right. Well, what, what happened was, as, as, we, as we talked about, Marcion wanted to scrub the Christian faith of anything that smacked Jewish. Oh. When once you start putting that kind of a filter, even if it's a Gnostic gospel, now you start making Christ into something that isn't historically grounded. So when the church said we need to have a historically grounded Jesus, not one that is created by Marcion or by created by whatever mystery writer uh, is writing about Jesus. Uh, if you don't ground Jesus, then Jesus simply becomes whatever you think Jesus is. And if you think Jesus is a Marxist, well, then you're going to write a gospel that reflects Jesus talking about communism and how great it all is and how terrible capitalism is. You know, so what did actually Jesus really say? That, you know, it, it, in the second and third century, it becomes like whatever we think, whatever I want. And so giving, uh, credence to your gospel is by giving it a, a name of an apostle so you know give but it I give it um, improve the improve your chances of, of having it be an authoritative gospel by giving it the name of an apostle well weren't a lot of the uh, non-canonical gospels just unknown to the latin church fathers or to the monasteries that were preserving things because the, the when was the canon? What year was the canon put together? It was like in the 400s or something? No, it, 165, I think is the 165? date. 165? Okay. But, but, that, again, but, it was the, the Marcionite controversy was the, the impetus. Oh, for, for doing that. Okay. For, for studying a canon. But, but for example, the Gospel of Mary, the Gospel of Judas, the Gospel of Thomas, those were like more recently discovered. That would be post that particular time yeah they were but but they were written late they were written you know second right. third century so they're not apostolic they're not apostolic uh and and they are complete fabrications uh they, they've taken maybe some kernels of historical you know mm. legend and then have blown it into other perspectives and you know mm. jesus is walking around um uh, displaying you know a divine temperament you know, and uh, almost like um, the the gods of the Greek, uh, you know, legends and myths, mm -hmm. you know, where these gods are coming down and doing these things. And, and again, for many of the Greek minds, this was like, oh, this is just great, you know, sci-fi literature, you know, we call it sci-fi. But for them, this was like, oh, another great novel, you know, just came yeah. out, yeah. you know, and um, en entertain me, you know, tell me something I don't know, hmm. you know. Um, so that was part of the appeal. Things that are always a secret always perk our curiosity, mm -hmm. right? It's like I walk around looking at the cat all day, and he's like, "Let's see, let's see what can I, what can I get myself <laughs> into?" You know, like, oh, I haven't been there. Let's see what's over there. You know, what does it say? Curiosity killed the cat. Well, mm -hmm. that's why the expression is because there are there's there's always an appeal of something that's a secret. That's why these secret organizations have are so appealing, like the, the Masonic orders. And the, the Templars and all these, ooh, it's secret. What's it go? What's going on in there? You know, and and uh, so it, that's part of the the appeal when it's yeah. so open and so public and you know, then it, it loses some that's of the uh, the the interest. That's why um, Eastern religions 
can become so popular in places like California and other places because it's like, ooh, this is different, you know? Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's not, not Christian. Or mm -hmm. like the little blurb I wrote t today, even the constant contact is spiritual, but not religious. Mm -hmm. You know, there are yeah. people who are saying, they're trying to reject what I've grown up. I've grown up Catholic. I'm going to reject all that and become a Buddhist because it's, it's not something that's common here. So the, the more um, uncommon it is, the more appealing it is. Mm -hmm. so. Well, that's what Jesus said. Uh, uh, you know, someone in their hometown is not going to be listened to because it's that's too right. ordinary, <laughs> too familiar. Exactly. Uh, that's why they, they, they usually move newly ordained priests and deacons out of their existing parishes uh, to, because, <laughs> oh, we knew him when he was, you know, I we knew, knew him great. when. <laughs> I yeah, knew you it's then. Like, it's like, yeah, I knew you then. Or like, you know, I, um, you know, when I would tell, when I was in high school and I was, you know, 16 or 17 and I was telling uh, girlfriends or girls that I was thinking about becoming a priest, they would look, they would laugh out loud, they would laugh and they, they thought, are you kidding me? You, <laughs> I, I, you know, so I, I knew that I was gonna have to, you know, leave LA. <laughs> and, uh, I came to, to Miami and San Diego, so. Hi. All righty folks, it is 1.05 and uh, it's been a pleasure to be with you all. Thank uh, we'll you. see you next Sunday. Um, well, for uh, those of you who are planning to attend, uh, our outdoor worship, and then I will probably um, see you in my office, or I may come back here depending on the time frame and uh, and begin our study with you all next week. And we'll take a look at um, next week. We're going to look at um, uh, the monastics, the monastic movements, oh, yeah. the uh, the movement for reform, and that kind of thing. Mm 